Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you how I use this antique camera to make ultra high resolution photo masks. So the idea is that we're going to take a picture of something hanging on the wall and miniaturize it in size and then use that miniature to translate it into a uh, metal pattern on a glass slide. So in this case, for some reason, I decided to use a tax form and made the tax form the size of a penny and shrank it all the way down. And as you can see, the minimum feature size is super small. It's taken me quite a bit of time to get all the tricks lined up in order to achieve this resolution, which is about 20 micron. Uh, so I'll show you all the tricks that I've learned with this camera, and then also show you what's going on underneath this black hood that you've always seen people use to take the picture. The benefit of using film to make these photo masks is that it's very cheap and easy. If you want complicated and impressive, you should check out Eugen's optics channel on YouTube, who's making a direct digital to uh, photo mask machine. Uh, but the trick with using film is that you can leverage the laser printer that most people have access to. And the laser printer has pretty good resolution, about 200 micron, and it can maintain that resolution across a whole page or even across a whole poster. So the trick is shrinking that great quality uh, pixel density from a poster size down to something small. And in this case, I have a couple of requirements. I need to cover a microscope slide, and I need to have about 20 to 50 micron uh, resolution across this whole slide. And this is for a project for another YouTube channel, The Thought Emporium. Uh, the goal is to make a microelectrode array on this glass microscope slide, and it will be interfacing with neurons. So basically, we want to have electrodes on the outside with wiring that go to a little tiny microelectrode array at the middle. So knowing that I have to cover a microscope slide will help us select what kind of film we need to use. So you've probably heard of 35 millimeter film about like this. And if we kind of put the microscope slide across it like this, yeah, it might fit. But the problem is that the lens in the camera is not going to cover a whole slide's worth. Like there's no way to, to get this much image in one shot from a 35 millimeter camera. So we can't use that. And then the next size of film up is medium format. But again, we have the same problem. Even though medium format is much larger, the maximum dimension is still not enough to cover a slide. So then we have to get all the way up to large format. This is a big piece of film. But luckily, we can put three microscope slides in one shot. Um, so that's what inspired me to, to buy this antique camera, uh, basically getting into large format. And luckily, they're not that expensive. I paid about around $300 for this, including the lenses and the film holder. And I think I got a pretty good deal, but in general, these things aren't too expensive. Another benefit of large format is the film is single sheets, right? It's one by one. And as you can see from all of my testing, I've had to go through a lot of pieces of film to sort of dial in this process. And if I were forced to use an entire roll of 35 millimeter or medium format film, before I knew I had a mistake, that would be very expensive. So in this case, actually doing it one shot at a time is the preferable way of doing it. And there's yet another benefit. Uh, in large format, you can get this very unusual kind of film called ortho-litho. So ortho is short for orthochromatic, which in the context of photography means not sensitive to red light. So you can open this box under safe light conditions and load the film and even develop it under safe light conditions, which helps a lot because you can see what you're doing. Normally, you'd have to handle black and white film in total darkness, which is, you know, more difficult. Uh, and litho, of course, is short for lithographic. And this, this actually means there's a, quite a few things going on in the film. One, it's very high resolution. Uh, two, it's very high contrast. There is an anti-reflective coating on the back known as an anti-halation coating. And um, it's also, um, well, I mentioned it's high contrast, but it's super high contrast, meaning that it goes from totally clear to totally dark, uh, almost snapping over. Like it, you would not use this to make normal photos. You would use this to really only do very specialized things like lithographic masks. Um, but you do pay a penalty. Oh, and it's also cheap. I forgot to mention uh, this box of 50 sheets. I think cost about $20. So it's, it's almost as cheap per frame as 35 millimeter, and it's actually cheaper per frame than medium format even, which is kind of funny. Um, oh, it's also high transmission in ultraviolet. So when we are shooting ultraviolet light through the mask to make our uh, lithographic process, uh, this lets a lot of UV through. So it has all these great properties, but the one thing you pay for is that this is not a very sensitive film. 
So you've probably seen films like 400 ISO or you know 100 ISO describing how sensitive the film is to light. This is about two ISO. So the exposures are very long. Even in the studio with lighting, uh, with proper lighting, the exposures are gonna be on the order of 10 to 30 seconds. So not a huge deal, but you can't use this to take pictures of things that move. Let's talk about the camera itself. This thing is impressive in how simple it is. Like for example, if you wanna change the lens, you just open that up and pull this out and then the whole camera is open. There's no power in it whatsoever. The lens itself is fully self-contained. So you basically load the lens like this and then to trigger the shutter, we just pull the, push this uh, remote release. And if you wanna hold the shutter open, it's got a little set screw here. So now the, the shutter is held open. And remember, since these exposures are gonna be up around the 10 to 30 second range, what we're gonna do is basically load everything up hold this thing down and set an external timer. And then when the time's up, you can release this and it clicks shut again. Pretty basic there. And despite how primitive all these um, you know, settings are, I mean, this is not a complicated screw mount or anything. It's literally just pushing this in and pushing a piece of metal in front. It works very well. It's actually very repeatable and I've had really good luck with that. The back of the camera is also simple, but quite a bit more fiddly than the front. So it has this ground glass screen on the back, which is how we focus it. And it also comes off. And the trick is that the distance from this flat piece of metal on the back to the very surface of this ground glass screen is super well controlled. In this camera, it happens to be exactly 0.2 of an inch. And the idea is that when this is snapped in here, the screen is spring loaded against that metal flange that's back there. And when we're getting ready, after we've focused the image by moving the camera, by moving this forward and backward on the rail here, when it's in perfect focus, then we know that anything that's 0.2 inches behind that metal flange will also be in focus. And since this is spring loaded, what we can do is take the film holder and slide it into the camera like this. And now the film plane is exactly 0.2 inches. And you'd think there's no way that could work. Actually, it works really well. There was one hiccup that we'll talk about in a minute, but by and large, this actually is very repeatable. Uh, since it's spring loaded, it's constantly pushing that thing up against there. And it's also surprisingly light tight enough so that it works out just fine. But I did have a couple problems with this. One, the focusing screen originally had this Fresnel lens in there to brighten the image. Well, I didn't find this brightened it at all. In fact, this makes it harder to focus because the, the lines from the Fresnel lens get in there and, and make it difficult to see what's going on. So I even did a side-by-side. -side, and as you can see, the, the side with the Fresnel is not any brighter. I don't even understand why they use this. Um, so I skipped that. Then I had to make some special spacers that were exactly the thickness of the Fresnel lens so that the glass would then be at the correct size. Anyway, I had to make sure that all that was working. Um, second, focusing this is quite a challenge. The image is super dark, and uh, that's why he used this black hood, of course. And so what we're going to do is um, focus the image with the camera so you can see what I see. Okay, so here we are looking at the screen. I'm going to open the shutter, and that's what you can see. It's actually not too bad. We're wide open, of course, on the shutter. But now I'm going to put the black cloth over the top here. And yeah, that's about what you're gonna see by eye. It's very difficult to tell what's going on. And of course, we need to focus this thing down to, you know, 22 microns of resolution. So then you have to use a little magnifier. And I tend to use this um, 10X optical loop. I find out that the best way to actually do this is instead of putting the loop uh, in my eye socket, I find the best thing to do is to put it against the ground glass and then look in. And I'll see if I can move this around so you can at least get a sense of what it looks like. Okay, so here we are looking at the image right at the center. And um, I'm going to move the focus on the camera. And as you can see, it's difficult to tell what's going on. The grain of the ground glass makes it difficult to tell when you've hit exact focus. So the way to go is to kind of swing back and forth through it and then kind of through muscle mem memory just hit the center point. So when you've swung back and forth through it, at equal points, then you stop halfway. And it does take quite a bit of luck and practice, but eventually it does work. These film holders are also quite impressive at how simple they are. Obviously, it needs to keep the film in total darkness until it's time to 
put it in the camera and shoot it. And so that's what these black shutters are for. So in, in normally in total darkness, but for us in safe light conditions, what we'll do is load the film in there and it looks something like this. It's actually got little wings around the outside to hold the film in place. So in dark, you do this. And then this uh, hinged part at the end actually keeps the film from sliding around. And then when you close the shutter, it fits into a lock here so that you can't unhinge that again. So it's totally safe now. And then when you slide this into the camera, it's now light tight around the outside. So then you can pull this thing completely out and the film is now exposed uh, to the inside of the camera. Uh, and while it's in the camera, it's also holding this hinge back down again so the, the film can't slide around again. Uh, and then you do your exposure and remember to put the dark slide back in. And there's also a felt seal over here so no light can get in from there. And then you're safe again and you can pull this whole thing back out of the camera. And then it's even got these little hooks here so that you can remind yourself which slides you shouldn't ever pull out again. The trick is if you have five or 10 of these film holders in your bag, you have no way of knowing which ones have been exposed or not, unless you're writing on here or using the little protectors. So this is actually great, but there's one problem I discovered, and this took a while for me to notice this problem. Uh, if you look at the reflection in the film, watch this. Oops, so the film is not actually held against the flat back plate. So I was doing a lot of experiments here and sometimes the middle would be soft in focus and sometimes the outside would be soft and not the middle. It's very confusing. And what's happening is the film is kind of bowing out in the middle. It's kind of got a little beer belly there. And there's no way you can fix that with these existing film holders because it's holding it around the edges, but it's, it can't do anything in the middle. So I came up with a vacuum film holder I'll link to plans for one of these online. And this is a little bit of a variation, but in this case, I permanently glued in this back slide. Normally these film holders are front and back, two pieces of film. But in this case, I glued the back shut and put a vacuum port on here. So now I've got these small holes drilled in it. So now when we put the film in, we can pull a vacuum on the back and that sucks the film back to the plate and keeps it from flopping around in there. And remember, microns count, so even though this, you know, in the standard film holder, pull this all the way out, you know, you'd say, oh, see, that's pretty terrible. I mean, that's, that's a few hundred microns of sag. So that thing's going out of the focal plane, and at that point, the image is, is completely ruined. So between the, the fixing up of the focus screen and the vacuum film holder, the camera is really tuned up, and we're ready to make an exposure. Okay, so with my crazy fast lens and crazy sensitive digital camera, you can actually see what's happening under safe light conditions. So I've got the film holder here ready to go. And what I'm gonna do is open this up. And funny enough, I can actually see what I'm doing better on the camera viewfinder than I can with my own eyes in these lighting conditions. Uh, and like you say, normally you'd be doing this in total darkness if this were normal film. So here's a piece of film that I'm going to put here and then quickly close the bag up just in case there's some kind of a lighting accident. And normally, you, since you can't see the film, you have to use this notch that's in the upper corner to figure out which side is the emulsion and which side is the anti-halation coating. And remember, that's just an anti-reflection coating so that any stray light that goes through there doesn't um, spoil the image. So we'll slide it all the way in and then fold this thing down, making sure not to pinch the film into there and then close the shutter and we're safe and we can turn the room lights on. Okay, so now we're ready to make an exposure. So with the lens wide open and the shutter held open, I'm gonna give it one last focal check and that looks good. So then I'm going to close the shutter and stop down to F11 and put the film in. Shutter is closed, so we're safe to take the, the black shutter out. And then we're gonna hook up the vacuum hose to our vacuum film holder and turn the pump on, and then it's gonna get loud so you can't hear me. But what I'm gonna do is use this little handheld digital timer and then just manually click the thing and click the timer, pretty simple.
the black shutter back in. Okay, then we'll put the black shutter back in. Take the film back out. And then we're ready to develop. So we'll put the safe light back on and then push this through the uh, chemicals to develop it. The film developer is a very temperature sensitive process. And it's quite chilly out here. In fact, it's so cold it's off the chart in terms of temperature correction for this chemical. So what I've done is I have this hot plate set to a very low temperature just to get us back up to room temperature. And I'm gonna pour parts A and B together in the uh, beaker and then pour it into the tray and then take the tray over to the safe light area. But this makes sure that the, the fluids in the tray itself are at 68 degrees F. Okay, so we got our chemicals lined up, the developer, the stop bath, the fixer, and then the rinse with just a little bit of um, photo flow, which is like detergent, just to um, make it dry without streaks. So I'll open up the film holder, take this out without scratching it. And one mistake I made early on was to not submerge the film quickly enough. So this thing has to go into the bath as quickly as possible. And then when it does, I'm going to start this little digital timer here. Two minutes, 30 seconds. Okay, two minutes, 30 seconds have passed, so then we'll get it into the stop bath. And this will obviously stop development so that we get a consistent um, timed development for each one of these. This only takes about 30 seconds. And while this is going, I'm gonna point out one other problem that I encountered, and that is the complicated sounding name of reciprocity failure. So normally film works that you can always just double the exposure with half the light and get the same overall effect, right? Like you can always increase your exposure time to compensate for having less light. But in the real world, things are never so ideal and most films, especially this lithographic film, has what's known as reciprocity failure, which means you can't just keep doubling the exposure time to get more and more uh, of, the, of, the, of the light. Like basically, as you get less and less light, the film gets less and less sensitive. So if you were going from 10 seconds to 20 seconds, expecting to compensate for a half as much light situation, you would find that you actually have to have even more exposure time to compensate. And this gets worse and worse the less light you have. So and to actually to make it even more complicated, if it's really cold out, that makes the reciprocity failure factor even higher. So I, this is actually a big problem for me because when it was really freezing out here in the garage, I would do exposures of about 30 seconds and find that was good. But then on a relatively warmish night, uh, I found that about 10 or 15 seconds were fine. So compensating for temperature when you're taking the photo at low light levels is yet another complicating factor. I'm gonna move the camera now so that you can see the fixer process. This is actually something that I've never seen before. You can actually watch the film going clear, which is a pretty cool process. Okay, so for the final step of development, uh, we're gonna put it in the fixer bath. And what you can notice is that the film is actually not clear where it should be. Like it's not black, but it's also not clear. And the fixer is what causes the uh, underexposed parts of the film to become clear. So this is kind of a cool process that I've never seen before. Even when you're developing photographic paper, you don't really see it because the paper, of course, is opaque. But in this case, like if you look up here with this um, uh, piece of the bottom of the pan, it only takes, it only took about, what, 10, 15 seconds to clear the film. And then I think the typical thing is to wait about twice the time that it takes to clear it. So if it really only took 15 seconds to clear it, maybe wait about 30 seconds. And then when it's done in the fixer bath, it's back to being safe uh, to have room light on it. So I'll move it to the wash bath, which is over here, and then turn the room lights on and we'll take a look. Okay, that's looking pretty nice. Uh, pretty good exposure. It's probably a little too dense. So if I were gonna do this again, I'd shave the exposure down, maybe about five seconds, but uh, overall it's looking pretty clean. Okay, while the film is drying, we're gonna get our slide ready for photolithography. And even though this is a very primitive looking method of critically cleaning it, I find that these uh, microscope slides are actually very dirty when they come out of the box. And so they actually really do need mechanical cleaning. It doesn't work to just you know put this in an ultrasound bath. 
And from doing actual testing, even though, like I say, this looks very brutish, with clean gloves and clean Kim wipes and clean IPA, this actually produces a, a surface that's better than uh, anything else I can do. Okay, uh, then we will load the slide into this handy dandy spin coder. And I think I have an old video on this that I'll link to if I can find it. And we'll put it into its low speed mode to dispense the photoresist onto it. And this photoresist is another funny thing. This bottle I filled up with some photoresist that I got off eBay years ago. And look what's happened to it. <laughs> the, uh, the solvent in the photoresist is practically dissolving its way through the bottle. I'm practically, you know, I'm very surprised that this stuff works at all. But it does, and um, I need a refill. And thankfully, Sam Zelouf has generously uh, offered to loan me some photoresist. The idea is we'll just kind of slather it on and then hit the high speed button and the spin coder will ramp up at a prescribed rate up to 3000 RPM. And what's happening is the you know, centrifugal force is pushing the solvent out and at the same time pushing air past the surface. So it's actually drying the layer to some extent as well as making it a very thin consistent thickness. Okay, so as you can see, we didn't quite cover the whole slide, but I don't really care about that. It's fairly consistent along here. Um, I'm not really sure what the problem is there. I probably need to use even more photoresist, but you can see that it's consistent in the middle, which is where it's going to count. And then the next thing we do is put this on a hot plate. Uh, we're currently at 100, uh, 105 degrees C, and we'll put it there for one minute. I'll use my digital timer if I was doing this for real. And the heat will drive off the rest of the solvent and get that thing ready for exposure. This is a really quick hack together exposure light that I made. In the past, I previously used a flatbed ultraviolet uh, set of fluorescent lamps to do exposure. But the problem is that the light comes from all directions and it sort of gets through the photo mask, you know, kind of crooked in all different ways and it makes getting high resolution very difficult. So inside this pipe, there is a uh, 70 watt metal halide lamp. And um, the idea is that the, the arc, it's an arc lamp, and the arc is sort of like a point source. So just getting that arc source um, far away from the film, even without optics, produces a pretty good set of collimated light. The downside is that it's not very intense. So you can see my digital timer there. We're gonna do a five minute exposure. So let me turn the light on and uh, we'll get set up. Okay, so the idea here is that we can take our slide that's coated with photoresist and put it onto this uh, dark felt thing just to prevent reflections and then align the thing that we've got our film here and we want to align the thing that we want to print onto the slide and then to push the film down onto the slide to make sure there's almost no um, gap there. I'm just going to use a piece of glass and position it kind of at the teetering point and then slide this whole thing under the lamp and then to make the exposure, I'm gonna remove this cover so that the light hits the thing and we'll set the timer for about five minutes. And you can see in a previous run, this, even though this looks really primitive and it is pretty primitive, it works well because you can actually see Newton's rings in there. So the, the glass, it really is compressing the film down to the slide below. It's at least getting down to wavelengths of light between there. And then the fact that this light source is far away and pretty well collimated means that even if the film is lifted off the surface a little bit, when the light shines through, uh, the shadow will still be very close to the size of the feature that we want. The developer for this positive acting photoresist is surprisingly simple. Actually just plain old sodium hydroxide or drain opener is, it works just fine. But I'm actually gonna use sodium metasilicate pentahydrate. Uh, apparently this is a little bit more forgiving, like the window of opportunity is a little bit bigger. And I tend to use three grams per 100 ml of water. And that's it, that's the entire of the developer. So I'll measure out three grams of this and dump it into the water here and then we'll develop it in that Petri dish. Okay, I'm gonna put the exposed slide in there. It's very hard to see, but there is actually a pattern that you can see in the photoresist even before we pour the developer in. Now we'll go in with the developer here. And you can see right away the pattern emerges. And in fact, what's cool is that the, that purplish color is actually 
a wisp of, <laughs> of dissolved stuff that's come off in the liquid. So it instantly pulls off the surface there and turns into this purplish stuff. And uh, again, if I was doing this really carefully without uh, worrying about dealing with the camera, I'd have a timer on this too for consistency. And again, we are on the hot plate here, this large serving hot plate. And um, that's all there is to it. It's about one minute in there. So I'll rinse this off. If we look, we can see there's a substantial amount of detail now in the photo resist. And we are ready to coat this with metal. You might think, ah, oh, I messed up. I didn't put metal down first before the photo resists. But we're actually going to use the liftoff technique. So I'm going to put metal down now and then get rid of the photo resist. And this uh, avoids the step of etching or dealing with any of the etchant chemicals. Here's the sputtering setup that I'm going to use to coat that slide in metal. And I've talked about this in previous videos long ago, I guess now, but I've made some upgrades uh, recently. On the right hand side, there's two mass flow controllers where I'll be adding argon to the chamber. And on the left hand side, there's a water cooler. And then above that, there's a electrophoresis power supply that's going to power the sputtering setup. So I'll zoom in so you can get a closer look. Okay, we've got the slide mounted in there face down on that fancy blue masking tape uh, mount there. And we've got argon flowing into the chamber. So I'm gonna turn on the voltage and hopefully we'll see um, this thing light up here. There we go. And it's purplish color now because there's a, a piece of titanium. We're gonna sputter titanium, but in air, you know, this bell jar was open and the titanium was exposed to the room air, which means it's got titanium oxide uh, on the top. And as you can see here, we're not sputtering anything yet. We've got all zeros across the board. And that's because the titanium oxide is very difficult to sputter. So currently, as the argon atoms are beating their way through that oxide layer, eventually we'll have fresh metal exposed and the color of the plume will change at the same time that we start getting more and more um, metal uh, coming off of the surface there. So we'll let this thing run for about a minute and you'll see the color change drastically right at the same time that we get more um, flow of, of metal coming off. We're running at about 110 watts. 550 volts at about 200 milliamps. And now you can see the color is really green. And over here we've got two angstroms per second. Should go a little bit higher than that once it's fully running. Pressure in the chamber should be about 10 or 15 millitor. I think we're probably just about running properly. So I'm gonna swing the slide into place by moving like that. And that'll cover up the little sensor in there. So this will go back to zero, even though we are depositing on the slide. And this will run for, I'll give it about five, maybe 10 minutes. Okay, the last step is to dissolve the photoresist from under the metal. And typically in this liftoff process, uh, you want to have a contour on there so that the metal doesn't form a bridge. Like the problem is how does the acetone get through the metal layer and into the photoresist? Well, in this case, it's such a thin layer that we're gonna, we're gonna get through it with some gentle brushing. I don't think this is a accepted technique, but it does work. As you can see, it doesn't take long. It's already blasted through there. And um, as I give it a little bit of very light brushing, it'll get through the rest of it. And the trick is that the titanium sticks so well to the glass, it's actually used as an adhesion layer. We're not really in any danger of brushing the titanium off. So we can be, you know, relatively aggressive with this brushing. So I'm gonna continue cleaning it up a bit and then we'll take it over to the microscope and see what we've got. Okay, so this is not bad. Uh, I've done better, but the, considering that I did this quickly kind of for the camera in, in one go, uh, this is pretty good. So as you can see, there's quite a few imperfections. All the spots are dust. Some of the spots are actually nicks in the wall, um, more than you might think. It's very sensitive to little imperfections in the wall. So you'll notice that there's more dust and spots uh, outside those uh, pieces of paper than there are inside. But nonetheless, there are quite a few problems inside too. So uh, Intel doesn't have a whole lot to worry about just yet. I've got a commercial scale laying there and the smallest divisions there are 10 micron. So clearly um, we're not quite at 10 micron yet, but an interesting fact is that 
I shot this at f11, and the diffraction limit for f11 is about 15 or so micron. So we definitely can't get lower than that. And uh, in some of my luckiest settings with the most careful setup and the most careful developing, I've gotten pretty close to about 20 micron. So I'm pretty proud of this, and uh, this will definitely be good enough to make those microscope slides for Thought Emporium. Okay, see you next time. Bye.